Hi everyone. Welcome to the final session of our three-part series of the Crypto Bootcamp. I'm Gavin Raftery, a partner in our Tokyo office. I specialize in finance and have been working a lot on fintech matters over the last number of years. In the first session, we looked at the basics of crypto, what crypto is, how we got here, some of the common use cases, key infrastructure, and how the different types of cryptocurrencies work. In the second session, we had a deeper dive into crypto regulation, looking in particular at the EU, the UK, Switzerland, and the US. This final training session was previously recorded earlier this year. In this session, we held a panel discussion on crypto regulation in APAC jurisdictions, covering Australia, Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, and Thailand. I was pleased to have been joined by my colleagues across these jurisdictions. First of all, we had Bill Fuggle from our Sydney office, Stephanie Magnus from our Singapore office, Karen Mann from Hong Kong, and Kularat Fongsathabon from our Thailand Bangkok office. Let's jump into the final session. Um, you know, the rapid emergence of crypto assets poses a number of policy dilemmas uh, for our legislators and regulators around the region. Um, I think probably the, the biggest one of these is really how to ensure that the benefits of transacting in these assets, you know, things like speed of settlement, lower costs, improved financial inclusion, and so on, can be offset against some of the risks, which are different from other asset classes. Um, things like consumer protection, um, the risk of financial crime, uh, improved or, or the risk to financial stability are things that have been identified and have been the focus of, uh, of regulators. Um, you know, one of the things that the regulators really are looking to do is to focus on what real risks exist here, um, but at the same time, creating a, an environment which actually encourages innovation. Um, this is an ongoing battle. Uh, innovation by its nature continues to change uh, and the ideas which are coming up are all new. Um, so our regulators are continuing to struggle with um, the right, getting the right balance. And in each of our jurisdictions, there's a slightly different balance that is currently in effect, as you'll see from some of the comments that come out later on through the panel. But these are the sort of things that we're going to look at in a little bit more detail today. So with that, I just wanted to really try and maybe get things started. Let's introduce our panelists to start off with. Can we go to the next slide, please? So today I'm very happy to be joined by four of our esteemed colleagues from around the region. These are sort of the all-star crypto team uh, in APAC. I've got Bill from Australia, Karen from Hong Kong, Steph from Singapore, and Kularat from Thailand. Um, together with me, I'm sort of representing Japan here, uh, the Tokyo office, but we actually for, for many years now have been very actively involved in the broader development of the fintech markets, including the emergence of crypto uh, and how it's evolved over a number of years, including the way the regulators are looking at it, including the use cases and, uh, and seeing, for example, Bitcoin go from worth very little to worth a lot, uh, as we see today. So we, each of us through the panel will be giving uh, an introduction to some of the, the nuances and some of the, the things in effect in our own jurisdiction to give you a, the opportunity to see that it's not just a standard one size fits all approach. That, uh, that regulators are taking around the world to some of the issues that come out. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, just to set the scene a little bit and to give you an idea about some of the different levers which are looked at by the regulators around the world and particularly in our region, I wanted just to set the scene by introducing some of the different participants in the crypto ecosystem. Now, I'm sure that many of you have heard of some of these. Hopefully some of you have heard of all of them. But there are a number of different players across the ecosystem that do really impact 
uh, the way the, the different roles and the different responsibilities are looked at. So if we start sort of on our left, we look at the crypto asset generation side of things. You know, the miners and the ICOs here, I mean, the, the miners, the way they come together to sort of validate the individual transactions. So cryptocurrencies are often mined by individuals and companies using processes which both validate the underlying sort of transactions, hence the decentralized nature of uh, a lot of the, the cryptocurrencies that we're talking about, but they don't do it for free. They do it to earn a reward. So miners, for example, in the Bitcoin system, earn a fraction of a Bitcoin for every transaction that they're able to successfully validate. The one thing about this that you're hearing a lot in the market at the moment, um, particularly with a lot of the focus around the world with Earth Day being just a little while ago uh, and the use of energy is mining is a very energy intensive uh, process. It relies on very heavy computer, computing power. Um, and so there are more than just cryptocurrency related issues from a regulator's perspective and a political perspective that come into this. There is the balance around you know, sustainability, climate change, and a lot of these discussions, the lines between them are getting blurred these days because of some of these overlapping issues that come through. Just more quickly to move through the rest of the crypto asset ecosystem here. We have the investors who, you know, this could be individuals, companies buying and trading crypto assets. We've got the exchanges who operate to facilitate trading. Um, and this is in the same way as a stock exchange or, or other exchanges work. You know, they can effectively create a platform for people to be able to buy, sell, trade uh, different versions of crypto assets. It's not just cryptocurrencies, but it's the broader crypto assets all benefit from and often rely on the role that exchanges play. Next one, I wanted to just highlight the important, important role of custodians. Um, crypto asset custodians, uh, they provide storage and security systems. They provide the digital wallets often that, uh, that people actually um, store their, their crypto assets in. Um, and this is becoming more and more important these days, particularly as we're seeing institutional money start to flow into crypto assets. So where you see institutional money, your professional investment advisors and things like that, when they're investing in crypto assets, they have to have somewhere to store those assets, you know, which is secure. Um, and it becomes because they're looking after money on behalf of others, they have additional obligations and responsibilities to ensure that those assets are stored uh, securely and, and correctly. And that's where the role of custodians in the markets and the ecosystem more broadly is becoming more and more important. We don't, not on this slide, but we're also seeing an emergence of aggregators in the ecosystem where we've got different platforms, different APIs, different apps um, and players who are effectively trying to make it easier to access the system. So for example, you might have an aggregator that provides a, a single point of entry to multiple exchanges um, or a single air space where you can coordinate your store uh, your information for your different wallets across different things. Um, then we have the traditional financial service providers. Um, this can include banks as competitors uh, in some ways, but also banks as participants in this market, as we'll see later on. But really more, it's the asset managers, it's the investment advisors, it's the investment banks advising on crypto asset related transactions. Crypto is becoming a, an asset class a whole asset class in its own right. And so it does bring in all players throughout the traditional financial services markets as well. And then finally, we have the central banks. There's a lot of talk at the moment about central banks issuing their own digital currencies. We are seeing that in this part of the world as well as other parts of the world. So the idea of there being a, a digital yen, for example, the Japanese government is looking at it now. Uh, they are working on proof of concepts and how that they can bring that together um, to see whether that would facilitate things. There's a lot of underlying sort of healthy tension between the, the public and the private sectors as to how cryptocurrencies are used and, and impact and relate to the, the markets. 
but central bank digital currency is a very important part of that as well. On then, just to introduce some of the, uh, the different types of crypto assets and particularly tokens, as that's going to be a, uh, an underlying theme that we're talking about today. So I think it's a good place to start when you're thinking about generally the different types of regulation you see is to really try and have a, a basic understanding of the way regulators are looking at things. And regulators are often trying to put crypto assets into baskets. By putting them into boxes, it gives them the ability to create some sort of standardized uh, approach to regulation. It also helps them recognize where existing regulatory frameworks may already be flexible enough to cover the particular asset that we're talking about. So if we start from the left, uh, we move our way right. So the utility tokens. So utility tokens generally grant holders access to a, a current or prospective product or service. But it's not like a, a share or an interest in the profits. It might be like a prepaid instrument uh, where you actually, it gives you a right to use facilities, sometimes in priority to other people. So you might have access to a particular service or, or um, sort of product before it hits the general market because you've actually uh, participated in or purchased the utility token. Next of all, if we look at payment tokens, payment tokens, um, these are often also referred to as exchange tokens. And this is really where you're talking about most of your, your public cryptocurrencies. So your Bitcoin, your Ethereum, and some of the other ones. These tend to be a decentralized tool for buying and selling goods and services. And their core functionality is as a means of exchange. They can be used for investment purposes, as we've seen with, with Bitcoin and others there. And there is a lot of speculation and speculative investment which goes into these. But the underlying fundamental is that they can be used as a payment and a means of exchange. The important thing about many of these is that they're not actually issued by a central authority. So they're very different from a fiat currency or traditional money in the way you might think about it. So token holders have rights, but they're very limited in nature in that what they can do. And they're not backed by a government or anything like that. Let's move on to e-money e tokens then. These are similar to payment tokens or exchange tokens in that they, uh, they are used as a means of payment. However, they usually are more closely aligned to a representing a monetary value. And they do have a central issuer. So where these ones, they might be referencing or linked to or backed by a central pool of US dollars or something like that, a central pool of assets, which is backing the underlying issues. And if we move to stable coins, and that's taking that to another level as well. So stable coins are a type of token where they've tried to effectively remove some of the volatility that we've seen in the market because of the speculation, because of some of the other things, by actually linking these and pegging these to certain assets. Now, the most common um, type of stable coin is, might be a, a stable coin pegged to the US dollar or a single unit. It might be the UK British pound. Uh, it might be you know, the Singapore dollar. It could be something else. We are seeing also stable coins that are pegged to a basket of underlying currencies to, again, try and remove the volatility in those. But one thing to note is that stable coins are not necessarily just linked or pegged to currencies. They might be pegged to something else um, to try and stabilize or remove the volatility in the market. Some of the other things that you can, might be able to think of is you might have a, a stable coin that's pegged to the value of gold, for example, or other sort of types of tangible or intangible assets that have an economic value and are, backed, are backing that stable coin. Stable coins can share other characteristics with security tokens or payment tokens, exchange tokens, 
And so these are not clear definitive baskets where you only fit in one. Sometimes they do uh, also tick the characteristics for multiple uh, types of baskets. But just looking at security tokens on the far right, this is really where you're getting closer to a share. Um, a, the security token is more aligned with a share, a stock option, a warrant, something that gives you the opportunity to participate in the profits and performance of a business. There are some other significant sort of um, detailed characteristics for security tokens, but that at the highest level is a, is a basic understanding. So I think one of the things that you can see with these is that they each have characteristics which make them unique, but they can overlap. And that's where the hybrid token, tokens come in. We are starting to see products which do share characteristics across, across these baskets and do complicate the regulatory sort of framework for how they fit together. One thing, this is a general observation, and this is not true in every jurisdiction, but as a general observation, what we see is as you move from left to right on the screen here, you should expect that the regulation will get tighter. So there's more regulation which will apply to security tokens, for example, than what traditionally would apply to utility tokens. That's not to say utility tokens are regulatory free or un unregulated, but there's an increasing focus from the regulators on the right side of this scale than on the left side. So let's move on then to, uh, to the panel. And I'd like to firstly look at um, a, a couple of different things, but we're gonna open it up with a broader discussion about the regulatory framework. So like any other financial services, there are multiple potential activities which might fall within the scope of regulation. Crypto asset services, which do sometimes tick these boxes can include all of the, the different things that are on the screen now. What I'd like to do now is maybe just open it up to the, the panel. Um, to get a, a brief introduction at a jurisdictional level to the, the way the regulators are approaching crypto assets in their jurisdiction. So maybe, can I start with Steph? Can you maybe help us understand a little bit about Singapore and how they're approaching broadly the regulation of crypto assets? All right, thanks, thanks Gavin. Um, I kind of like the way um, you've set it out. First, looking at the um, what the token actually represents, right? That's the first, uh, first thing. And the second one is um, what services or activities um, are actually within the ecosystem? And if so, is there any regulation around that? And I think, um, you know, certainly in Singapore, um, these two things are actually looked at, right? So um, if you look at uh, just, just remembering your screen on the left with utility tokens, or just very broadly speaking, in order for us to determine whether a particular token issuance or a token falls under regulation, uh, we do need to determine the nature of the token, right? Whether it is a utility token, a payment token, e-money, a stable coin, or a securities token. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, on the right side, right, where it's a security token, um, you know, that's certainly uh, regulated under the local um, legislation. Uh, where it is a um, payment, uh, where it is a e-money, it falls under e-money, um, and typically um, a stable coin, which is linked to USDT, for example, a USDT or US dollars, uh, that would be considered e-money. That's also regulated under our current uh, payment services legislation. Um, and uh, where it is a digital payment token or what we call a digital payment token or a more traditionally or cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ether, where, it, where, it's, where it's not linked to currency but used for the payments of goods and services, um, then that is actually currently also regulated under our payment services um, legislation. So, you know, it's not a one size fits all um, that we do need to make and uh, to do need to look at the token and analyze whether any of them fit under various pieces of legislation. Uh, the primary ones being the securities and futures legislation and the payment services legislation. Okay. Um, and then even then, 
we do then need to think about what activities are actually being conducted. So let's say a particular payment falls within um, a digital payment uh, token. Uh, it's crypto, it's Bitcoin, it's Litecoin or something similar, right? Uh, what am I then doing with that token? And does that actually cause me to um, be conducting a licensable activity um, under the payment services legislation? Um, and if I can go back to the slide before, if that's possible. Yeah. So, um, for example, um, at the moment, under current legislation, um, exchanging tokens, so actually um, facilitating an exchange or um, assisting with the dealing of tokens, whether it's uh, crypto to crypto or fiat to crypto exchanges, um, that is currently a regulated activity. Okay? What is currently not regulated uh, but will be regulated very soon uh, would include um, the custody of um, these tokens as well as the transfer of these tokens. Okay, so as you see, you know, we do need to look at the type of token, but also the type of services which someone is actually um, providing um, and whether those services are actually licensable activities. Um, so as I mentioned, and, and that is actually changing all the time. And it's also changing because um, of, um, you know, broader FATF and AML KYC um, obligations. Um, so I, I would maybe just pause here. I do, I do know we, we do have uh, other jurisdictions to get through. But that's the general framework that we do need to look at. What type of token is it? What type of services are actually being provided in respect of that token? And whether or not um, that's actually a regulated activity or not. Bearing in mind that things um, and the legislation is actually changing um, all the time. And I can come back later to talk about some of these changes. Thanks, Steph. That's, uh, that's a very good point. And uh, I think that's probably true for all of us in all of our jurisdictions that things are changing. You know, there's it's always movement in this space from a regulatory perspective. Maybe we can move now on to Bill in Australia. How is how are they handling things down in Australia? It's pretty interesting in the sense that Australia really, from a legislative and regulatory perspective, it almost like it just doesn't acknowledge that there's any such thing as tokens. Um, and in particular, the only token specific legislation or regulation is actually in relation to anti-money laundering, which I think is pretty common across most jurisdictions. Um, and that's really because of the obvious threats uh, in, in the context of anti-money laundering of crypto assets. So what that really means is that other than the anti-money laundering, Australia is really treating um, crypto assets with the philosophy that there shouldn't really be a differentiation between something which is done on paper or online or electronically or by whatever method. So Australia has a general philosophy of trying not to differentiate regulation between paper and electronic. And that flows through to the tokens. And what it means is that tokens will be regulated as a function of what they do as a matter of substance not what they do as a matter of form. So if you've got a token which uh, as a matter of uh, substance amounts to an interest in a managed investment scheme, then you're going to be regulated as a managed investment scheme. If you've got a token which amounts to a non-cash payment system, then you're going to be regulated as a non-cash payment system and so on and so on. So what that means is that you really have to you can't just simply say, oh, I've got a, uh, a crypto asset, therefore. You really have to say, I've got a crypto asset. Now I've got to figure out what that amounts to as a matter of substance in the context of each way in which any investment or any uh, thing that involves payment of money could be regulated. Uh, that as, you, as uh, Stephanie said, the situation is always shifting around. And so the most recent thing happening in Australia is that there's a big push to be able to have uh, ETFs where the underlying is Bitcoin. And that is driving the Australian regulator ASIC to look at making uh, at least Bitcoin specific uh, rules uh, or, or to oversee the making of specific rules 
on some of the Australian exchanges, in particular ASX and CHIAX. So it's an evolving situation, but at the moment, generally speaking, Australia sticks to its line of not regulating uh, things differently because they're on paper versus electronically. Thanks, Bill. That's really interesting. Kularat, are the existing sort of financial services sort of laws relied on in Thailand or uh, is there a separate sort of system uh, and framework for crypto assets there? Right. Thank you, Gavin. So apart from the existing laws that may be relevant, like payment law and securities law, there's a specific law regulating cryptocurrencies and digital tokens. It's called the Emergency Decree on Digital Asset Business Act. This law was issued since uh, 2018. Um, and digital asset in this sense it means both cryptocurrencies and digital tokens, which currently cover utility tokens and investment tokens. Um, that uh, for investment tokens, only those that do not fall under definitions of um, traditional securities, which would then be regulated under securities law. So investment tokens, what it means is um, they are pretty similar to investment contracts and investment participation in some, some countries. And therefore, um, investment tokens could be similar to security tokens, which are regulated under securities law in some countries. So there's a little bit of a difference there when you compare um, the approach of Thailand um, and other countries. So the law regulates um, two main activities. First is uh, it regulates acting as an intermediary, like acting as an exchange, a broker, a dealer, fund manager, or an uh, investment advisor. And the definitions are quite similar to traditional securities world for that. Um, another activity that it regulates is the fundraising activities using investment tokens and utility tokens that are not ready to use from the date of selling. Um, and this is sometimes still referred to in Thailand as a regulated ICO and must be done through ICO portal, whereas um, these projects sometimes in other countries may be referred to as STO. So however, the SEC issued a hearing for a potential change to move investment tokens and not ready to use utility tokens to be regulated under securities law instead. However, this would take some time and is still uncertain right now. Uh, from payment side, um, in earlier in March, the BOT issued um, an announcement stating that for uh, e-money tokens and, and fiat back, especially uh, Thai baht back, stable coins that are picked um, uh, you know, the stable coins that are picked with Thai Bart and are intended to be used as a means of payment may be classified as e-money uh, regulated under the Payment Systems Act. And therefore, those wishing to provide services involving um, Thai Bart backed stable coins are required to consult with the BOT beforehand. For foreign, foreign currency backs uh, or asset backed stable coins, as well as algorithmic stable coins that are not illegal, the Bank of Thailand is open to receive comments and feedback uh, before considering further regulatory guidelines as appropriate. Great, thanks, Clara. Karen, in Hong Kong, how are things developing there? Is it similar to some of the other jurisdictions we've been hearing about today? Yeah, in Hong Kong, it's actually um, quite different from Thailand, as Colorado was saying, and it, I think it actually kind of tracks quite closely with what Bill described in Australia. So in essence, Hong Kong, we do not have a crypto specific regulation. Uh, not to say that regulators are not looking closely at it, it just feels that in Hong Kong, the usage is not wide enough that imposes any material risk to financial stability here. So in the end, whenever there is any crypto business or crypto offering here, what we need to do is still go through the same traditional analysis and to try and see whether or not the crypto falls within any of the existing regulatory regime. So pretty much in the same way, like Bill was describing, you know, we'll have to analyze for each crypto, whether it's a security product, is a derivative product, is a futures product, does it amount to money, does it amount to a commodity, or does it fall within the nature of a store value facility. So it depends on the nature, depends on the use of the crypto, we, we would then figure out um, whether or not it falls within any regulatory regime. And it may also well be that crypto doesn't fall within any of the regulatory regime, in which case it will not be subject to regulation in Hong Kong. Thanks, Karen. That's it's really interesting. I know that uh, Japan has a, a again. It's a little bit of a different approach. Um, Japan has 
included a lot of its crypto related regulation in the Payment Services Act uh, in recognition, recognition of some of the overlap there. So it's similar to the approach by, adopted by Singapore in many ways, um, but it has actually created very specific crypto related uh, rules, um, particularly as they apply to exchanges, for example. I mean, Japan obviously over the years has been subject to a number of very high profile um, sort of hacks and other uh, incidents around the crypto market, which encouraged and incentivized the regulators to move very quickly to try and make the, uh, the, the framework and the ecosystem more robust and to address some of the risk or perceived risk in the system. So exchanges are regulated quite carefully, quite closely in Japan um, and, uh, and require licensing. Um, and that's to do more than just sort of apply AML type of requirements on them, uh, but to really ensure that there's a robust uh, and stable um, ecosystem in which participants, both retail and wholesale can, uh, can you know, uh, get involved uh, and, uh, and play in that sort of market as well. So listen, I think as you can see, there's a lot to absorb in how different crypto assets and services are regulated in different markets. Now, I, I thought we might move on to the, the next sort of section um, of, of our panel today, which is really focusing on some of those differences between the retail and the wholesale market. You know, we are seeing more companies now um, look at accepting some type of cryptocurrency in, their, in the way they're sort of operating their business models. It's not just sort of a, a mums and dad investing in Bitcoin um, for uh, you know speculation or other purposes type of discussion anymore. It's so much more complex than that. And so there are different sort of concerns which do come through. Um, and maybe we can go to the next slide as well. What I thought we might do here, and I wanted to sort of uh, ask each of our panelists maybe to, uh, to look at a, a different type of activity here, but Again, we've got different jurisdictions are really focusing on different aspects of things. You know, some of it might be the fraud, um, the risk or the perceived risk uh, around the use of cryptocurrencies in, in the black market or the need to have very robust AML and CFT uh, rules which apply to participants. Um, other might be just from a stability perspective, a consumer protections perspective, looking at the payment services and how that flows through. We've got particular sort of risks or, or uh, approaches that are being applied by regulators to financial stability, DeFi and infrastructure and how that flows through. And we've talked a little bit about already the balance between trying to encourage innovation and not stifle it through over-regulating uh, the markets and as we go forward with there. So with this, I'd like to sort of maybe start it off by, maybe I can ask Kularat to, um, just introduce a little bit about what's happening in Thailand around, you know, financial stability and DeFi and, uh, and how the regulators are looking at that from a, a retail versus wholesale market type of, uh, of approach. Sure, certainly. For, for, for DeFi in particular, I, I, think, um, I think the whole cryptocurrencies market, uh, especially the more and more it is being adopted, would, uh, in a sense, uh, impact the financial stability. And that's why the financial regulators around the world are very focused on how to deal with that. But DeFi in particular, DeFi um, comes from uh, the term decentralized finance. And it has been increasing rapidly globally, not, not just in Thailand. There's, there's a, um, um, uh, a community in Thailand, but I believe there are others as well. So um, DeFi has been increasing rapidly since last year and is continuing to grow despite some, some hacks, some rug pulls, some Ponzi schemes going on with, with some platform and uh, projects. So um, it's, DeFi is almost like a, a whole financial system that relies on blockchain, smart contract and cryptocurrencies to do financial activities without a need for a bank or other traditional financial uh, intermediaries. So DeFi platforms allow people to do financial activities like earning interest in savings like accounts, doing lending, borrowing, sending funds, yield farming and liquidity mining, um, speculation on price movements using derivatives, trading crypto, insuring uh, against um, risk that comes from trading, 
So there are the whole financial activities going on in, in, in a, another world. And uh, the fact that uh, cryptocurrencies as well as DeFi have been gaining more momentum to potentially challenge the traditional money system. Sometimes they call it like a, another shadow banking system, another shadow financial institution system. Um, I think um, this is a common concern among governments and regulators. So most governments and regulators are trying to understand DeFi and see what can be done to, to regulate at least certain aspects of it. But technically it's very difficult, but I think all of the financial regulators are looking into that. Thanks, Kilrad. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I think a very um, closely watched area at the moment in, in many markets, as you said, it's definitely not just Thailand um, where we're seeing some momentum in the market being to try and create that type of ecosystem um, and, uh, and the concern of the regulators to try and ensure that it doesn't introduce sort of risk or, or instability into the broader markets and things. So all of these sort of topics that we have on the screen now, I think, are relevant to the DeFi discussion, whether it be around, you know, fraud or Ponzi schemes and, and the risk of that type of thing coming through to the AML, to the consumer protection, um, the balance between innovation versus sort of uh, regulation, um, and then also trying to ensure that we're protecting against volatility there. Great. Thanks. Maybe I might just move over to Bill then. And you, you mentioned before about ETFs in Australia and, uh, and how they're sort of coming through as a new product, particularly the crypto linked ETFs. And I imagine from a regulator's perspective, thinking retail versus wholesale here and the disclosure requirements that usually go along with sort of ETFs and other retail focused, retail investor focused products. This must be a really topical and, and um, I suppose area of focus for the regulators in that way as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, very much so. And also for the exchange, not just the uh, ASIC, but also for the exchanges as well. So, and I think that does flavor which of these uh, five, er five areas are the Australian regulators focused on. So uh, unlike Thailand, there's not really a perception of a threat to the uh, monetary system or anything like that. It's really sort of a focus on uh, investment safety. So it's about fraud, but not so much from an AML fraud perspective, but just from a um, stealing of, of tokens from people's wallets via cyber crime. And it's also a focus on the volatility, you know, uh, and, and it's probably more of a focus on the big mainstream tokens like um, Bitcoin and to a lesser extent, Ethereum and some of the others that follow off the back of that. But the main things that uh, ASIC is focusing on at the moment is really from the fraud side, it's really how do you properly and safely custody a uh, crypto asset. And so there's an, an enormous amount of learning and effort which has gone into this aspect. And you know, some of the organizations you mentioned before like Coinbase have put an enormous amount of effort into being uh, appropriate custodians and to convincing regulators that the mechanisms that they've got uh, safe from a custody perspective. That also flows into audit as well. So, you know, how do you audit uh, that someone actually has a crypto asset when you've, um, when you've cold stored and sharded the asset to use some of the um, crypto lingo. So there's, there's custody, there's audit, but then there's also just a straight up volatility. And so, you know, those are the sort of things that have really got um, ASIC thinking very hard in Australia at the moment. Um, you'll be aware that there, there has recently in Canada been two ETFs launched, which have Bitcoin as the underlying. And Australia is probably not too far away from being able to launch some uh, Bitcoin ETFs as well. So, um, so it's a pretty dynamic and interesting area. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I think, um, you know, we're probably going to see more products like this come around the world as well. I just I was reading earlier today that Bloomberg has just launched officially a both a Bitcoin and Ethereum based index, um, which could drive further development of, of ETF type products and things like that to, uh, to try and give that, uh, that existing infrastructure and build that into the way sort of we're looking at these new asset classes as well. 
I think the other slight wrinkle on all of this is also that um, up until fairly recently, the exchanges were quite reluctant to allow listings of token prevalent businesses. So Bitcoin miners, for example, perhaps weren't welcome on ASX pre, uh, in years past. And I feel like that's another area of shifting as well, where the exchanges now kind of no longer see it as kind of a red flag if a business is somehow focused on crypto tokens. So that's another interesting area of development where those organizations can get access to capital now because the exchanges are getting more used to the concept of that type of business uh, and seem to be likely to allow them to list in the relative near future as well. Now that's really interesting. And uh, with the maturing of the market, the improved or increasing participation by the incumbent institutions, the regulated institutions as well, um, the confidence that that's bringing to the market, I think is, is helping to drive some of that change as well. Steph, I think in Singapore, we've recently been involved in an N NFT sort of transaction as well, right? Yeah, I just wanted to talk about two things. One is uh, crypto derivatives and the other one was NFTs. And just very quickly on uh, crypto derivatives, um, because this kind of uh, drew out the whole wholesale versus retail um, sort of uh, review and thinking by the regulators here. So, you know, crypto derivatives essentially can be traded and on leverage basis. And so therefore very volatile, um, pretty, uh, risky instruments. And the question was whether or not uh, crypto derivatives would actually be regulated in Singapore. Um, generally, de derivatives are regulated, but here the underlying was a payment token, right? So, so how do you then consider that? And um, it was actually raised in Parliament as well, um, given the risk of crypto assets. Um, and essentially, I think the policy um, thinking uh, behind that and the responses to Parliament is you know, look, it's a risky product. Uh, we're going to um, actually have um, advisories and warnings to retail the retail investors that there is a risk in terms of investing in crypto products. Uh, but by regulating it, um, these, this could confer misplaced confidence uh, that these products, uh, which are highly volatile products, are actually appropriate for the retail investors. So they actually took the view to not regulate uh, crypto derivatives unless crypto derivatives were traded by in a already a licensed exchange or um, being offered by one of the licensed entities in Singapore, um, but not to actually have a regime to actually regulate, um, you know, exchanges just to do crypto derivatives. Um, you know, I think that there was an understanding that these could be appropriate wholesale institutional products, but um, the view was that there are very few retail investors currently investing in it. Um, so let's not um, give it, um, there shouldn't be any confidence placed in it, so we won't regulate it, but instead we'll actually provide warnings that this is going to be a difficult product. So that's how they, they treated uh, crypto derivatives um, quite interestingly. Um, but they did say that they'll, you know, do watch, they will watch the space as to whether uh, retail investors are going into a product like that. The second one on NFTs is quite interesting. Um, NFTs are fairly new, um, they stand for non-fungible tokens. Uh, primarily used in the art world at the moment. And I think um, it made headlines maybe a couple of months ago in March where Christie's um, actually um, sold a, um, a token, essentially, I think at least at the end of the day, um, memory, <laughs> right, in, uh, in respect of an art piece. Um, and that token was actually sold for $69 million. Uh, US dollars to a investor that is based in Singapore. So what and what that investor um, actually does with this token, he claims to have the um, largest uh, uh, NFT fund in the world, um, and he buys these tokens and um, fractionalizes them and issues it to potential investors. Um, I think in an interview that I read, he thinks that the, his $69 million investment will go up to a billion dollars. Okay. Um, and, and also, um, many of these NFTs are actually sold in exchange for Ether, um, and that is apparently, or that's one of the, it's been said that that's one of the contributing factors to um, Ether's rise um, in the recent months, and I think it's just um, over the weekend, it went over 3,000 US dollars 
um, and I think it's about 300% um, above what it first started as. So NFTs is, is something to watch, um, you know, how, how um, certainly a lot of money is being put into it, um, and it really is, at the end of the day, crypto art, um, and, whether, um, and whether there will be any regulation. At the moment, it's not, but there have been interesting things that have come about. So, um, uh, and maybe one, one quick example um, that we've seen lately. So I don't know whether you remember, you know, um, growing up, I guess, um, you used to be able to buy cards, right? Um, maybe go into a store, uh, buy a selection of cards uh, for a dollar or two dollars. But in some of those, they could be actually fairly um, unique or valuable cards, which actually cost more than that, that the price, you know, the price that you paid for it, whether it's baseball cards or car cards or whatever it is. So one of the things which is currently being um, looked at is whether um, this can actually happen for NFTs as well. So say you've got a uh, NFTs and you buy uh, 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 you buy essentially into a basket of NFTs, but some of these NFTs may be more valuable than others, right? Um, are there any regulations there? Um, in particular, is that a game of chance and is that gambling, right? So, you know, these are fairly interesting things which um, uh, we are, where we are looking to apply uh, current rules or current laws into really new ways of, um, uh, you know, how these products and services are actually being um, carried out and, and some of these things which are happening in the, in the current market, um, you know, with the underlying technology that there is. So again, you know, very fluid, but certainly things that um, quite an interesting area to, to keep watch. Yeah, thanks, Steph. I, I totally agree. And for anyone, if you'd like a little bit more information on NFTs, um, the actual, the first session in this series, uh, the introduction to crypto actually did talk a little bit about how NFTs work um, and, and what they are and why we're actually seeing a boom in them all around the world. You know, what's the, the consumer behavior behind sort of some of the, the emergence of that trend. Um, so I would, again, I'd encourage you to, to watch um, the, the webinar for, for session one if you haven't done that. Just for this last um, sort of topic today on our panel, I wanted to quickly just cover off a couple of different trends that we're seeing from a regulatory perspective in our different sort of uh, markets around the region. And I think, first of all, I might actually turn to Karen first, just for the uh, the trends in Hong Kong, particularly around VASPs and uh, and how that's sort of developing. Um, it's a it's I think slightly different to what we've heard today from uh, from some of the other sort of markets and the way the uh, the regulators are approaching things. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. So in Hong Kong, as I mentioned earlier, there's not really a crypto specific regulation as such. But the way that Hong Kong regulators are trying to approach um, virtual assets or crypto issues is this. So for those that are not regulated, it's kind of just open to everyone to retail. But for those that feel that falls within a existing regime, they try to regulate it within an existing regime. And therefore, at the moment, we do have um, uh, virtual asset trading platform that is regulated by the Securities Commissioner. And, and VAPS is kind of an extension of that. So at the moment, um, the Securities and Futures Commission regulate trading platform to the extent that they have a security token that is being listed on that platform. And what the virtual asset, what we stand for is actually first virtual asset service providers. And that's actually driven by um, FATF, Financial Action Task Force, um, one of those AML um, kind of oversight regulatory uh, body and, and kind of mandated Hong Kong to go and look at regulating virtual asset service provider. And the way that Hong Kong regulators and the government is approaching this issue is again, focusing only on the trading platform. And to them, that makes a lot of sense because the trading platform is the starting place where um, people gather together to buy and sell virtual assets and cryptocurrencies. So they felt that regulating the trading platform would be the way to start. But a very interesting aspect about the licensing consultation and which ties into the last topic is the retail versus wholesale point. So again, Hong Kong regulators feel that investor protection is one of the key risks for cryptos in Hong Kong. So the way that they wanted to approach it is that they would like um, virtual asset service providers to be accessible by professional investors only. So that's really driving the market to a wholesale market versus a retail market. 
But the very interesting thing that comes with it is the trend in Hong Kong, because nowadays, because of the regulatory trend to limit access to virtual asset to professional investors here, we see the trend where the incumbent financial institutions are all trying to think about different ways to offer service around these platforms. So it's in the same way, like, you know, where, where we have a traditional stock exchange and we have a bunch of um, intermediaries around it, whether it be the um, exchange participants, the fund managers, the custodians, the broker dealers, etc. Now that Hong Kong have a licensed um, virtual asset trading platform, plus a consultation regime for more licensed trading platform, which do not only hold securities and um, virtual assets. What, 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 the, what the market is looking at is, okay, fine, if there's a way that Hong Kong market seeks to regulate it, then we just focus on the wholesale market. So that actually created a lot of interesting um, new development in Hong Kong. People are looking at offering financial advices to um, ICOs, like being financial advisors, underwriters, sponsors to ICO, fund managers, uh, managing virtual assets, taking advantage of the virtual assets available, the platform available for them to trade, custodian services, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, we see actually a very interesting um, trend in Hong Kong nowadays. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you. And Kularat, how about in Thailand? There's a couple of important trends there that, uh, that are on the screen at the moment. Um, we're running out of time, but maybe just two minutes on, uh, on that, please. Sure, sure. For the first one regarding the fund, so the Thai SEC issued a annual licensing scheme for a digital asset fund manager who wants to invest in digital assets, including crypto, for its clients. And personally, I think fund management will be a global trend, especially in a form of like a private wealth management, because many investors would like to have some exposure in this asset class. Everyone hears about crypto, but they feel a little bit scared and they would like professionals to take care of some of the risks, especially asset keeping and many other operational risks that comes from investment uh, in cryptocurrency. In, in addition to that, um, some regulators may put some qualifications of the retail investors to invest directly into crypto, but may be more flexible if those investors will do so through professionals. So I think that's why fund management could be a global trend. Another one is a custodian. So in Thailand, asset keeping business operators, be it exchange or brokers, if they keep assets of the uh, customers, they must use a third party custodian's uh, core wallet to hold the majority of the client's assets if the threshold is triggered. And I believe a few countries have already issued frameworks for digital asset custodian or custodial wallets already. And Thailand will also introduce one soon. And I think if more regulators start to require the use of third party custodian, this could be a business expansion opportunity for some players like global banks or big digital asset players. And uh, also that could be potential um, expansion of insurance products to cover crypto assets as well. Yeah, no, really interesting stuff there. Steph, do you just want to finish up with a quick introduction to the new Singapore Omnibus Act? Sure, just 30 seconds on that. Um, so essentially, the Omnibus Act is, um, hasn't been passed yet, but they're looking to regulate uh, persons who set up in Singapore, but their business is outside Singapore in respect of any dealing in digital tokens. And digital tokens means payment tokens as well as security tokens. So essentially, you can't just set up a holding company here, um, but you know, do your operations completely offshore and, and, and uh, think that you're not regulated. So this Omnibus Act actually catches that and more broadly um, catches essentially or look, is looking to capture together with other legislation around the world um, any regulatory arbitrage around uh, digital token uh, legislation and regulation. Thank you for attending and we hope you enjoyed our Crypto Bootcamp series. To find out more about our offering, please get in touch with me or your usual Baker McKenzie contact. We provide regular updates on crypto asset regulation so please visit our website and blogs to keep up to date on the latest crypto news. Thank you.